this week on all the all new and improved CrossFeed. A new Da Vinci Code. Will Bibles be allowed at the Beijing Olympics? California classrooms trust in God. Do abstinence only programs work? And televangelist finances. Welcome, everybody. I'm Pastor Jim Butler out in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. No, just kidding. <laughs> St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. I don't have a picture of that. I don't see it. doesn't picture you... my church, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. So in case you didn't figure it out by now, uh, we've got a few changes. Hopefully the um, the picture is a little bit clearer for those of you watching the video, and hopefully the audio is a little bit better too. I got some different headphones, uh, better microphone, and uh, and I, I noticed the past few episodes uh, I really had to bump up my voice in order to make it sound okay, and I, I don't think it was very good. So hopefully the audio is a lot better on this one too. Um, we had a different opening. The um, cleaned it up a little bit anyway, and um, you'll also notice uh, either um, next to me if you're watching the video or if you look at the album artwork and the audio, uh, we have a new logo. So it's uh, it's like the old one, but um, we kind of Simpsonized it a little bit. So I was I was gonna just you know put a picture of Reverend Lovejoy in for um, Jim, but. <laughs> Our commandments clearly state that beer is all right. I don't think the one that that's supposed to look like me really looks like me. But I don't think that was the, the, the other one looks much like me either. But that's life. So um, especially now that I got the beard, I'm, you know. I'm, yeah, after you do it, now that you have the beard. Yeah. <laughs> but don't worry, come next March, April, beard will be gone. So it's just it's getting to be the winter time, and uh, so we decided to go for it again. Now, Dale, you, I mean, you, you 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 bought leopard, you bought new headphones, you you, you know, you're, you're upgrading. I think Congress needs to look into your finances. <laughs> hey man, that's my own senator. <laughs> well, that's that that should be good. Uh, there he is, Charles Grassley, uh, yeah. who, as I understand it, he is an evangelical Christian himself, right? Yeah. 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 Well, what's going on here is uh, Senator Grassley is uh, beginning to do some research um, into televangelists and their finances. Yeah, you know, he heard some, you know, um, about preachers who ride around in Rolls Royces. Uh, Joyce Meyer paid thirty thousand dollars for a conference table. Um, she has a marble top toilet. For twenty three thousand. Yeah, for twenty three thousand. And so he began to say, somebody needs to start looking into this, and what are these people doing with their money? And, you know, what's happening to it and stuff. Uh, now, you, you're probably not old enough to remember the 1980s and the television. <laughs> tele yeah, I, re I remember the scandals. 1980s. Okay. I, you know, yep. uh, yeah, and the televangelist scandals, scandals then with um, uh, Jimmy Baker and... Um, um, who else was the other ones that were really uh, blowing it in those days? Uh, oh, well, Ruth, Jimmy Swaggy and Robert Chilton and his Word of Faith yeah. ministry, Iron Maiden. Uh, yeah, this okay. is um, this this is the the cover for um, the single "Holy Smoke," which was actually a song written about that whole scandal. Okay, yeah. And uh, I remember Robert Tilton, they found, uh, you know, this. they went in this dumpster, found this dumpster full of prayer requests that he got. All the money taken out of it, of course. Uh, but of course, now, this, that. now this, this, this really hits me because I was telling Dale, I got paid today and I paid my bills today. Okay? And I don't have $23,000 for a toilet and I don't have $30,000 for a conference table. And I don't have a Rolls Royce. So, you know, this really, you know, gets after me. And, and there's two sides to this. Number one, it, it, it's interesting because they talk about 
well, they shouldn't be looking at us because we've got our own boards of directors who watch this kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. A lot of those boards of directors are... They're, they're yes men. They're just rubber stamps. Um, yeah, that was the word I was going to use. Yes men. Yes! I know of a church, and I'm not going to say the name of it, and I'm not going to say how I know know the place and know what's going on there, but I do. And the, the senior pastor, um, and then you have his wife is the preschool director. His 26-year-old son has just been hired as the headmaster of the school. Uh? His son, at 26 years old, is getting $53,000 a year. Wow. Oh. And he doesn't have a degree in education. Huh. That's um, interesting. Oh, yes, it's real interesting. And, um, this, you know, and um, stuff going on there like um, the elders passed what the salaries are going to be. The next day, the, 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 the senior pastor walks in and says, here's, here's the salaries for next year. You know, use these numbers, not the numbers they passed. Um, hmm. oh, and uh, uh, they bought a tractor for the church's use, which has never made it over to the church. It's doing the pastor's four-acre yard. And uh, it's just, you know, and, and, and one of, I'm sitting there, one of the members is telling me that this church is telling me this stuff. And I'm sitting there going, what about the elders? What about the board of directors? Aren't they doing anything? They just rubber stamp whatever he does. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know. The whole point of elders is to hold the, um, well, one of the points is to hold the pastor accountable. Absolutely. And more than that, it's it's not the pastor's job to decide those things anyway. It should be the church council's decision. That's how our church works anyway. Well, yeah, that's how our church works, but that's not how a lot of these churches work. And in this particular situation with uh, these, um, um, the, these independent ministries, um, there is no accountability. I mean, they 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 do what they want to do, and um, and that's that's um, the end of it. I mean, it's uh, uh, amazing to me. Um, some some of this, I, I love this Crayflow Dollar Ministries College Park. I don't know. I would change my last name. I really would. You know. Yeah, I was thinking that too. <laughs> that's not one I would go after. Uh, but he said, Ironic, anyway. Yeah, he said, you know, um, this, this investigation could affect the privacy of every community church in America. Most community churches don't bring in a million dollars a year. Yeah, most community most community pastors are not driving Rolls Royces, right? Or I have, uh, let's see, in in his case, uh, private planes, um, uh, love offerings for visiting ministers, which are you know pretty significant. See, you just need to know this guy. And then get a love offering from him. Yeah. You just know the wrong people. I guess I do. You know. Mm -hmm. um, or and then my other one, favorite one is Bishop Eddie Long of the New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. I didn't know Baptists had bishops. Yeah, neither did I. I thought they were congregational. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, th I thought that was interesting, but, you know, uh, um, it's it's just incredible some of this stuff. Uh, Randy and Paula White of the Multiracial Without Walls International Church and Paula White Ministries, my goodness, two organizations, were asked about home purchases in San Antonio, Texas, Malibu, California, and New York. And again, they're in Florida. I mean, this is four homes. Credit card mm -hmm. charges for clothing and cosmetic surgery, and a com Bentley convertible is a gift for Bishop T.D. Jakes. I got a bad feeling about this. Yeah, cosmetic surgery. Can you imagine putting that one as a line item on your church budget? <laughs> man. Well, you got to understand, man. I, actually, I could. I mean, you know, my church has to look at me every week. So, you know, they might well, do that, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what I look like. You've got it figured out there. But, you know, I mean... Given me, I mean, yeah, I can see them want to do that, you know. Um, 
what I really got a big kick out of is you put up another link later on. Um, some guy responding to this, Dr. Norman Robertson, who claims to be uh, a, 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 an ac- quote, acclaimed authority on biblical finance and biblical concepts of successful living. I, I want to know where this doctor comes from, and I want to know. I never heard of this guy. Um, and uh, I, I just love this. He says, he points out that Jesus was not poor, nor were the disciples. He cites several scriptures to support the claim. In Matthew 2, 11, Dr. Robertson points out that kings came to visit Jesus at the age of two and brought lavish gifts. Yes, his parents also had were so dirt poor they had to give... Um, pigeons for their offering, which was only, you know, the only thing below that was giving wheat. I mean, they were, you know, dirt poor people here. Additionally, yeah. in Matthew twenty seven thirty five, he points out that Jesus wore expensive clothes. That's in the passion. Jesus has just been, you know, put this purple robe on him because they're mocking him. Somehow or another, yeah, well, there's this cool accessory. It was called the crown of thorns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. And this Jesus cross came wear, with it. Yeah. <laughs> that was it was a bundle. <laughs> but the Jesus deal. actually did wear uh one expensive garment and that was his priestly robe. Um the one that they gambled over. But the point of that was not that this was this, you know, expensive thing. The point of it was that he is the great high priest. And therefore, it was basically the one possession that he had um, was this this robe. I think and, um, uh, Paul Meyer's book, um, In the Fullness of Time, would dispute that, that that was a beastly robe. It was more the, the undergarment, the one-piece tunic. But we can argue that later okay. on. But either way, I mean, he didn't have anything. He was homeless. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you read Isaiah 53, the idea is that, can you change that background now? Look at that guy over your shoulder is getting real scary here. Uh, <laughs> but looking at, you know, if you read Isaiah 53, that prophecy of Jesus talks about how he's going to be deprived of anything and he's not going to have anything. And uh, he's going to be despised and rejected. And, you know, his life was one of deprivation and poverty. Mm-hmm. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Uh, you know, so, I mean, this guy was, ju- you know, just kind of a, 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 a um, uh, it's, it's really sad. I mean, he, he admit, you know, he points out that, you know, they do good things. They bring food and clothing to the homeless. Um, and, um, you know, uh, um, and they do relief work. And, and I, I that's good stuff, but I don't think it justifies a lavish lifestyle. No. Um, no, I mean, you know, you think about it. People are giving their money to these organizations, assuming that this money is going to be used to um, to spread the gospel, to, you know, to share the message of salvation, um, not to give the... Uh, um, uh, not to give somebody a nice marble toilet seat. Oh, no. No, 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 no. They, they know that. There was one I, I saw one sometime, and they were back in the Jim, Jim and Tammy days, and uh, somebody was talking to you know what about him having this this bathroom with this gold plated you know, um, you know fixtures and this air conditioning for his dog's doghouse, and uh, this guy said that just shows us God's blessing him. This this is this is we all want to live that way. You know, he, he's doing God's work. He should receive all that. That that's that's what that shows that he God's behind what he's doing. No, it shows that he's duped a whole bunch of people. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm telling you what the guy said. I mean, you gotta. Understand. Well, yeah, I know. You know, I mean, this is prosperity gospel, and there's a wonderful book. I don't know if it's still in print by Michael Horton, who's an Anglican actually, um, called um, Agon, "The Agony of Deceit," and he he really tears apart this. Uh, He's now part of uh, White Horse Ministries, I think. Uh, the White Horse Inn and um, is it Reformation Today is their magazine. I think it is. I think that I can't remember the exact name of it. I'm sure somebody out there is going to know White Horse Inn and Michael Horton is going to tell me the name of that. But um, you know, 
and he really is the agony of deceit was his book. He just tore apart the the the, the this whole prosperity gospel. Um, hmm. Jim Baker wrote a, his uh, wonderful book in the 1990s after he got out of prison called I Was Wrong. Oh yeah, I heard of that. And um, the paperback was condensed. The hard back, the hardcover was really yay thick. It took me a while to get through it, but. First off, saying how his this, his lifestyle and stuff was wrong, but then really getting into my theology was wrong, hmm. and leaving behind this theology of glory. This is what this is: the theology of glory, and going to the theology of the cross, and wow. learning stuff, and then and then talking. And then he said the interesting thing though was was getting keep you know and looking at the Bible and looking how he had misinterpreted it. You know, and into this prosperity stuff. I mean, just like this one, this Dr. Robertson did with, you know, Jesus had expensive clothes. And, yeah, they looked and said, man, that was so stupid. What was my world doing believing that? And he said the most interesting thing was, was the letters he was getting from people who were accusing him of abandoning the faith because he is denouncing hmm. the prosperity gospel that he once preached. Wow. So. Yeah, that's sad. I mean, if if God... If, if if having a lot of money is evidence that um, that your that God is really blessing you and that and, and that that He wants to, to to keep up what you're doing, right? I mean, look at all of the the rich, corrupt people in the world. You know, I mean, in general, you'll find that you know, if anything, the um, the more a person is uh, is faithful, the poorer you're probably going to be. You know, I mean, you look at the apostles; these were not rich people. You know, they suffered, and, and that's what it's all about. It's about suffering. As a matter of fact, if you read Paul's defense of his gospel, remember he had the super apostles. You know, and they're like, "Look at us! Look at the miracles we're doing! Look at this we're doing! Look at this! We're, we're just so cool! It's not even funny." And uh, Paul turns around and he says. Uh, let me defend my gospel. Let me show you that I'm really an apostle. I've been whipped. I've been beaten. I've gone hungry. I've gone naked. Um, I, I have the sword in the flesh, and I asked the God to take it away, and he refused. And he said, my uh, suffering is made perfect in weakness. That was his sign of being an apostle. Yeah, you know, his suffering and his work for the Lord. And... Um, you know, every year I always preach on, um, it's, it's, uh, one of my favorite texts for Thanksgiving is always Philippians 4, where Paul says, I've learned to live in plenty or in want. I've learned to be content with having everything or nothing, whether well fed or hungry, I can do all things through Christ to give me strength. And that's lacking the prosperity gospel. There's, I'm a king's kid. Hand it over, God. Yeah, and, you know, and that's not to say that if you're rich, it means that you're faithless. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't just, you can't look at your checkbook balance and decide whether God's favoring you or not. Right. The reality is that yes, God is favoring you because Jesus died on the cross to take away your sin. And so no matter what you do, God's going to favor you. He still loves you. You know how he chooses to bless you. Some people he blesses with, um, with financial gifts. Some people he blesses, you know, with with all kinds of other gifts. I mean, I wouldn't trade my family for all the riches in the world. I'm just tremendously blessed. I have a great marriage. I have wonderful kids, you know, um, great relationship with my parents and stuff like that. And and so I'm truly blessed. Do I think that I deserve that somehow? That God is, you know, is blessing me because I've earned that by my faithfulness? No. No. That's the whole point of a gift. Is you can't earn a gift. It's given regardless whether you deserve it or not. And God blesses everybody. He causes the rain to fall on the um, on the good and the evil. On Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Speaking of good and evil. Anyway, uh... <laughs> <sighs> let's go. Let's move on before I really start ranting on this the prosperity gospel stuff. It's just. Um... Hey, do you Too think late. they'll let the prosperity gospel be preached at the Olympics? Hmm. Well, 
And I suppose it depends uh, how many Bibles you want to bring along with you when you do it. One, two, one, two, three, four. Or if you're a part of Falun, uh, Falun Gong or whatever, however that you say that. Uh, yeah. All right. Basically, the, the story goes that there was a um, some confusion about... Uh, there was a, a rumor going around that... China was not going to allow athletes to bring Bibles with them when they came over. And uh, people got kind of up in arms about it pretty quick. And uh, who was it? They contacted the um, the Chinese embassy. Uh, and a few other and, groups, too. It's, uh... Yeah, and they said, no... This this is the the word from uh, the director of the Beijing Olympics Media Center. He said this kind of report is an intentional distortion of truth, and I ought to know because intentional distortion of the truth is my stock and trade. <laughs> <laughs> he said texts and items from major religious groups that are brought for personal use by athletes and visitors are permitted. So emphasis on personal use. In other words, all right, you can bring that stuff as long as you don't share it with anybody else. It's uh, Each traveler is recommended to take no more than one Bible into China. So you can bring it as long as you don't give it to anybody. Okay. It's for your personal use, period, end of discussion. And, and, and you know, I mean... Because uh, I, I, we we often forget, I think about how um, I don't want to say necessarily persecuted, but re- definitely regulated religion is within China. Uh, worship is allowed only in party controlled um, churches, temples, and mosques, um, and Bibles can only be printed by Amity Press and distributed from them. So, um, you know, yeah. it's uh... just to give you an idea, I was talking to a, a pastor from our circuit um, who was in China not too long ago uh, adopting a daughter. And he took along some the uh, Good News magazine put up by Wally Schultz and, and they were translated into Chinese. And he was handing these things out to people and and it had a picture of Jesus with the crown of thorns on the cover. And people were pointing to that picture and saying, who is that? They had no idea who Jesus was. Now, in America, whether you're a Christian or not, no matter who you are, if you see a picture of Jesus, you know that that's Jesus. That's the, the, the guy that the Christians worship. You know, even if you don't know why, you know, anything about him, you know that that's Jesus. And you probably know that he died on the cross and um, and, is, and and rose again from the dead. You know, whether you believe that or not, but, I mean, this is common knowledge in America and most of the Western world. But in China, people don't even recognize him. I did not know that. Right, so it's... it's um, um... But it's interesting, yeah. Uh, you know, each traveler is recommended to take no more than one Bible into China. No more than one. They don't want this stuff going out. They, you know, and um, instead, we got to keep those people, you know, out there making those iPods and making those toys with uh, lead paint in them. You know, that's that's what that's what they're <laughs> supposed to do. Can't can't have this religion stuff in there. Yep. Foreign visitors can can bring religious texts for personal use and are limited to three copies of each kind of text. So, um, I love this this statement. There is no value needed more in the world at this critical time in human history than religious tolerance. Now, this is, this is coming from the senator that contacted them. And, and I, I agree with that completely, but China is not the place where you're going to find that. Now, keep in mind that up until end of August... This show was getting into China. People were there were watching it. Uh, in fact, besides the United States, China was our number. It was our number two um, country as far as downloads go. 
no more. It's been blocked now. I've heard of so banned website already... and now we're banned in China. Yep. Yep. The website was banned a long time ago, but the podcast is still getting through because we use a couple of companies called FeedBurner and PodTrack um, that it, it runs through their servers first before it, it goes out. And um, and so it was because of, of those companies it was still getting there, but now they've blocked FeedBurner and PodTrack, so, which means basically all podcasts, or not all, but a lot of podcasts, um, can't get in there anymore. So, so, and why? Because you can't have these kind of messages getting in there. You can't have people, you know, hearing about Jesus or anything. Well, no, it's more than that. You can't have you can't have freedom of the press at all. You can't have anybody telling you how life is like outside of China. I mean, right. they don't want you to know that. They they uh, that's 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 part of you know uh, uh, having. The, the idea of the United States over the years has been let's, let's, let's trade and, you know, as they become more prosperous, um, the uh, religious freedom and political freedom will follow capitalist freedom, will, will follow prosperity. Yeah. It hasn't happened. Good theory. It hasn't worked yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just a... a, a it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. I mean, um, as time goes on, because again, I think if they ever allow, it, 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 it's sad too, because um, you know, uh, wherever the, the gospel has gone, there has been. Well, it brings freedom. That's the problem. And uh, yeah, there's a there's a wonderful book uh, by Alvin Schmidt called um, what's called Under the Influence. Uh, which I thought was the dumbest name because it sounded like you're drunk. Uh, but uh, it's it's now how Christianity affected the world or something like that, changed the world or something like that. But it talks about how Christianity changed the Roman Empire and, uh, you know, it, uh, by banning um, infanticide and exposure and oh, sure. ended slavery in many countries. Uh, within China, mm-hmm. it, uh, you know, they, they, it, it caused uh, women to... Uh, Put an end to foot binding. Uh, they used to, you know, bind the feet of women to keep their feet small. I thought that was Japan. Okay, maybe it was Japan, but you know, it, but it, it's in Asia, Asian countries. But this this helped end it. I mean, one time China was, was there were a lot of Christians there up to the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, yep. So it uh, something again to look at. You know, it's it's we need a a real tolerance there, and uh, it's not going to be in China. And get an oppressive atmosphere. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship. But. But you know what China would really like to have, though, is a good sex ed program to support their one child only. Okay. That, I had I had a different Captain segue. Abstinence. I had a different segue, but we'll 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 go this route. Um. Concentrate, Pinky. Concentrate. I don't know. Okay. Part of me. <laughs> it's Captain Abstinence. What is that? It looks like the tick. Um, yes, it does. <laughs> I never know. I had, I had never heard of that one. Okay. And I, I found it on the uh, Washington University website of all places. Okay. Um, I'm always, I, I, I don't want to say that somebody's employer uh, or the person who pays for the study affects what's been found in the study, but there's a study by um, Douglas Kirby, senior research scientist at ETR Associates. Um, And he came out with this study that said, um, at present there does not exist any strong evidence that any abstinence program delays the initiation of sex, hastens the return to abstinence, reduces the number of sexual partners. 
However, and this was uh, this report was being released by the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy. However, two things you got to be need to be said. Number one is this guy is a uh, senior research scientist at ETR Associates, which just happens to sell sex education curricula, uh, none hmm. of which teach absent. So uh, you know, there's there's that question. Um, the other thing is he wrote this to debunk what the report called myths propagated by abstinence-only advocates. So in other words, you know, he, he, he didn't write a thing to come out and say, gee, how, how effective is this? How effective is this other one? How does it work? He didn't, he didn't go at it with, with a neutral viewpoint. He went out to say, I need to find the evidence. I want to debunk these things. Right. Right. Yeah. He had an agenda going into it, and any time you know, if you if you're out to to prove something, you know the whole thing with science is not to prove but to disprove. And he was trying to prove something. And now, according to the study, um, it says there does not exist any strong evidence that any abstinent program delays the initiation of sex, hastens the return of abstinence, or reduces the number of sexual partners among teenagers, um, while abstinence-only eff abstinence -only efforts appear to have little positive impact, more comprehensive sex ed programs were having positive outcomes, including teenagers delaying the initiation of sex, reducing the frequency of sex, reducing the number of sexual partners, and increasing condom or contraceptive use. Two-thirds of the 48 comprehensive programs that supported both abstinence and the use of condoms and contraceptives for sexually active teens had positive behavior effect. You know what? Personally, I question how much of an effect any of them have. <laughs> because what it comes down to is, what's going on in the homes? Right? You look there. And you look at what their parents are not only teaching them, but what they're doing. And, and that's where you'll find, yeah, 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 and have been doing, have done in the past. That's where you'll find the influence, and that's where you'll find what, um, what the kids are actually going to do. Way right? back when, when I was, um, my da daughter was an infant, uh, we were subscribing to Parents Magazine. And... Uh, it had a lot of good stuff in there, but after you've read after you've subscribed to it for about four years, you've read everything because they start re repeating everything because there's a new generation of mm -hmm. parents coming up. But one of the articles on that was the first sleepover, and is about this um, you know this is the single mom, uh, newly divorced, and dating this guy, and you know when 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 it's okay you know she had a four year old girl daughter. When's it okay for me to have my boyfriend sleep over for the night? Never. You know, and talking to people at work and, oh, you've got to understand, she, you know, she's got to see you as a sexual being. She's got to see you as a whole person, you know, yada, yada, yada. And, um, you know, and uh, there was a storm and, you know, he was worried about driving home that night. He goes, oh, why don't you just spend the night with me? Any monkey business is ill-advised. And, um, you know, and, and, and I was sitting there reading this guy. Huh? Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's the kind of stuff that's going to cause, you know, I mean, if mom and dad have been, you know, uh, um, having their boyfriend or girlfriend spend the night with them, they're not going to see any reason not to. And you sit there and say, well, you're just 15, you're not old enough. Once when has that worked? Yeah. It doesn't work to say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. It doesn't do it. Once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. Yeah. It's, um... It, that, that's where the influence is. I mean, that's where the impact's going to be. Um, it, it doesn't matter what they teach them in school. I mean, yeah, to some degree, it's going to matter. All right? But parents still have the biggest impact on their kids' behavior. It's, uh, it's master's call. Yep, and uh, you know that that is uh, the biggest part of it. 
You know, what do they see in their parents? What do they hear their parents doing? Um, and uh, that's that's what it comes down to. Um, but it's a, it is a a a, a concentrate, you know, Pinky. So. Concentrate. It's a very frustrating thing. It really is. And uh, as long as I've been in the ministry, it's gotten me more frustrating. Although, I mean, even there. <laughs> I've known kids raised in really good homes. Parents taught them really good morals. Par parents uh, were really good Christians. and Yeah, they still managed to mess it up. Oh, yeah. Yep, seen that too. Um, but, and, but, I mean, the worse you do as far as, um, you know, setting an example, you know, the worst, if you set a good example, they might follow it. If you set a bad example, they will follow it. <laughs> That's about the truth. Uh, one other thing, though, about the study. It relies, there's one other part of it. It assumes kids are telling the truth. Now, True. Because you're sitting down interviewing the kids. Or they're they're writing something out. Now, I'm going to tell you. We're in trouble. Had I been in high, a public high school, and you were asking me this stuff, I would have lied through my teeth. I would have said the most outrageous stuff. Just because it'd make it fun. You know? And, oh, and especially if there's been a big emphasis on something like abstinence, and they know that, you know, oh. Well, they're uptight about this stuff, so you know we can we right. can really get them uptight. Also, I'll tell you something. Uh, up in um, back when I was in Holyoke, we had a uh, um, doing this vacancy at a church, and um, one of the women there at the church was a uh, librarian in one of the public schools, in the public middle schools, and the story she used to tell me. Yeah. Oh my, it was just like, and I, I, and this was middle school, you know, I would just... In the library? In, in the library, in the gym, in all kinds of other places, and uh, she was just like, man, uh, you know, it, it just was just like, wow, um, and then you kind of understand, uh, and... But again, a lot of it is, you know, what 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 example the parents set, and and what is the relationship of the parents? Because a lot of these kids are, are <laughs> to go urban cowboy on you. They're looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. So. Well, you know, and the other thing is, how is it presented? Is it presented where you're going? This is bad. You know. Or is it presented as saying, this is something really wonderful in a certain context? You know, I mean, there's a huge difference in those two methods of, of presentation. Yeah, I I remember you and your, your confirmation class. We won't go there. You know what might help these kids, though? That might be to have In God We Trust stuck up on the wall. In God We Trust. Oh, yeah, there you go. That'll do it. Yeah. Now that this was interesting, Bakersfield, California. Uh, now I'm confused by this article. Uh, it says um, um, uh, that um, the trustees voted four to one to mandate displays bearing the nation's motto "In God We Trust" and other historical documents over 2,300 district classrooms and offices. So it's going to be a display of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. But what, I, what I'm confused is, is, it said the board president um, said he would vote against it. And then later on... Um, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The two tr uh, trustee Brian Bailey said 
Um, he could support displaying the posters in some classrooms, but not all. Two other members of the five-person b- board said they do not support the proposal. So I'm trying to figure out... <laughs> How did this kid vote it in? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 thought, I count four votes against it, not four, four votes <laughs> in favor of it. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, that's so I. Uh, that's what I couldn't figure out is in reading this. Um, yeah. When I looked at it, I, I kind of asked why. Sort of, what's the point? Um, they said, uh, I encourage the trustees to put this on the agenda. It's very important. We need to promote patriotism and promote it in our schools. We can't just assume that the younger generations are going to have that strong love for God and their country the way older generations do. But the question is, is putting some posters on the wall, putting a big sign that says, In God We Trust, which is the same thing that they read, you know, on their money, um, is that is that all of a sudden, are they, are they going to go, Yeah! Yeah! God loves me, and Jesus died on the cross to take away my sins, and because of Him, I'm going to live forever, because of something they read on their money? It works for Joyce Meyer. <laughs> Now, now that's in God we trust, right there. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> she reads it thirty thousand times, twenty three thousand times. There is, you know, for the toilet seats. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> you know, I had one person say, "Tell me, they go, I like listening to your podcast." You go. You two are so cynical. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we are too. <laughs> well, you know, we've seen it all. Yeah. So anyway, um, looking. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I mean, God. Who is God? You know. I mean. You know, God. Somebody. You know. I mean. I mean. You know. God's somebody who's out there somewhere doing some some weird thing, whoever it is that we trust. Um, I, I mean, this is like I don't know. Yeah, I, and then she even says this isn't a religious thing. This this is patriotism. I did not know that. You know, um, you know, it's not political. Political. It's not religious. It's patriotism. American patriotism yeah. of love of God and love of country. It's pride in our country. Well, if patriotism is it, I can, you know, that there's another word for that. It's kind of idolatry. <laughs> yeah. You know, love of God yeah, is, you know, love of our country is our. Yeah, how do you love God that you don't even understand? That just, yeah, I love this thing that's out there somewhere, wherever it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, how do you define God? Well, this is American civil religion. Are you a God-fearing man, Senator? You know, yeah. You know, I mean, that's what it is. It's this generic, uh, 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 you know, God that's out there that, uh, you know, that the president talks about when he says, well, God bless America, that Mitt Romney sits there and nods his head, too, and, you know, is a good Mormon, and, uh, you know, the local rabbi nods his head there, because, you know, and, and, and the good Muslim all nod their head, you know, there's this generic God out there. Uh, yep. So, that's the other great religion in America, besides football, the American civil religion. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, those other gods, they're not going to save anybody. So, I mean, under the doctrine of, of of natural revelation, you know, we can know that a God exists, and we can, yeah. in a very broad sense, worship that God. I mean, uh, at least have a reverence for that there's something greater. Paul, uh, mm-hmm. when he uh, preached his great sermon to an unknown God, he said, this is God that you worship. The word there for worship is to have reverence for. Uh, and what is unknown to you, I will make known to you. 
But he talked about mm-hmm. then the natural revelation that there's this, you, you know there's something beyond the gods here. Uh, and that's what exactly this is this is comes under that natural general revelation that we can know that there is something beyond us. There's gotta be something out there. But we're right. but it's a special revelation in scripture that tells us who and what that is, who that God is and what he's done for us and how we can really know him. And how we can really love him. Right, right. Because from just from observation, uh, and you know, from looking at your conscience and things like that, uh, really, what are you going to determine about God? But that you're, excuse me, accountable to Him, and uh, that's not going to save you. You know, that can produce. We talked about this last night in my confirmation class. It'll produce contrition, but not repentance. Contrition being sorry for sorrow over your sin, uh, like Judas had, um, but contrition didn't save him. Uh, or repentance, which is not only contrition, but it's faith that God forgives our sins. Or it produces anger, because I'm going to tell you something. From natural revelation, this God is very arbitrary. I mean, there's droughts in Georgia. In floods in Texas, you know, yeah. there's, there's, you know, uh, next, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, your house got burned down in Southern California. I mean, that's a capricious, arbitrary, you know, that, that's just, you know, yep. and 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 you know why, and that's just, it's just, it's just, it's just not a god to worship, if you ask me. But, uh, but scripture tells us something else. It tells us that no, they're, they're, we're in a fallen world, and uh, and that all those things are sign. And, and but this, this, this God loves us and he wants to have a relationship. These these things that drive us crazy, these horrible things, are really a sign that the end is coming, and we can have a, a, a hope in there because it reminds us of the return of Christ. Hey, God, my brilliant. Oh goodness! I don't know how to segue over into at the um in heaven they sing the song of Zion uh to God uh holy 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 uh, is the Lord God Almighty who was who is and who is to come so the question is is the tune that they're singing it to man this is convoluted. The tune that was written by Leonardo da Vinci in uh, his Last Supper painting. I'm going to tell you something. That was a pitiful segue. That really was. <laughs> Man, that was reaching for it, buddy. <laughs> Not that I've had some bad ones. Uh, this, this, this is interesting. Uh, and apparently this has been going on for some time because this guy's been taught. Uh, um, they've noticed for some time apparently that the um, the hands of the where the apostles are um, can be look like they could be musical notes. Um, and into uh, one guy said uh, Gregorian chant. Um, they thought of has. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, Alessandro Vizuzzi, a Leonardo expert and director of museum, um, said that, yeah, yeah, the, the hands of the apostle in the painting can be substituted with the notes of a Gregorian chant. But this guy, uh, his name is Paula. Uh, Giovanni Maria Paula. Giovanni Maria Paula. Yeah, and his website's in Italian, too, so. You have to Google Translate it. Anyhow, so what he says happens is that it, um, um, he he added in the bread loaves, and yep. then they and played it backwards. It. <laughs> yeah, played it backwards. Yep. <laughs> Bag masking. Yeah, it started with Da Vinci. Um, but that he, um, Arvetta, Iron Maiden. <laughs> 
But he said, he said, uh, you know, uh, but but with Da Vinci, you can almost get away with that because Da Vinci was known to write in code backwards and to do things that way. Right. Yeah, that was sort of his standard thing. Yeah. And he said you came out with this very, very short segment that's slow but very musical and sounds good. And the guy said it's almost Bach-like. I imagine that means um, the, uh, the Bach's requiems and his passions, not the Brandenburg Concertos. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So sure. it's, uh, so yeah, the result is a, a 40 second hymn to God. And he said it sounds best played on a pipe organ, which is the instrument most commonly used in Leonardo's time for spiritual music. The tempo was almost painfully slow, but musical. Hey, on his website, do they, do, 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 do you get to listen to him play this? I couldn't find it. Okay, that's, that's course, what I would I, like to. Have I done. didn't translate it first. I was just looking for this picture, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, that's what I'd be interested in hearing him. You know, hearing it played. What? 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 Uh, like. I think you have to buy his book, and it, the CD is included with the book. So I, I mean, I imagine it's probably out there somewhere. But yeah, you know, there you go. <laughs> just post it up on iTunes. You know. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting. He says he stressed that his discovery has not revealed any supposed dark secrets of the Catholic Church or of Leonardo, but a new figure emer emerges. He wasn't a heretic. Well, he emerges as a man who believes, a man who really believes in God. Pinky, I believe I have conceived yeah. my most brilliant plan to date. And uh, so here's my question: What happens to the melody when you take the um, the image and then you invert it on itself and shift it to the left a little bit? Do you get some nice chords, or does it become a, um, a, a you know, really horrible sounding kind of thing? Well, considering what the painting looks like, if you do all those weird things people want to do to it, yeah, probably, you know. <laughs> um, now, it's interesting is that he, you know, th this actually sounds possible because uh, Da Vinci, among other things, was a harpist. Yeah. The harp and the lyre and some other things. So... Yeah, this one, it's, you know, this was kind of, it was kind of refreshing, really. Like, okay, if you're going to look for stuff like that, it's kind of nice to actually have somebody who's not trying to rewrite history. You know, it's just like, oh, whoa, hey, look at this. There's music written into the painting. So, mm -hmm. interesting, you know, a painting with a soundtrack. Leonardo da Vinci, the first podcaster. <laughs> yeah, and in case anybody, by the way, watching this is kind of wondering, what, what, what's he looking at? Uh, I, I just heard some noise outside my office window, and uh, so I was trying to figure out what it was. Uh, you know, when, when you're up in this ch church, you know, all by yourself at ten fifteen at night, it gets a little scary. So uh, it's Captain <laughs> Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got a comment, by the way. Um, we need to talk about here. On YouTube, yep. from yep. Um, a guy who says um, this goes talks about the Islamic Saudi Academy last week, and yep. uh, he uh, takes issue with the uh, results that were found. Uh, remember, we, we talked about this last week. There's this uh, group that uh, looked at that school and looked at what was being taught in Saudi Arabia and really, you know, concerned about the religious freedom there. And um, he says uh, he's going to graduate. Uh, He's a senior there at, uh, at the Islamic Saudi Academy. He says, when we learn many useful things, for example, how to show respect for people and other religions. And I think the ISA is one of the best schools in USA. Go ISA 2008. So we appreciate that comment uh, from Blue Yo-Yo. Uh, and um, so we appreciate his perspective as being a student there. Yeah. Yeah, love to be able to. Of course, the whole problem, the whole uh, story was that uh, they didn't really. Uh, the government wanted to take a look at what textbooks they were actually using, and they weren't able to to get a look at that. So it would be interesting. Um, so Blue Yo Yo O Eight, if you're um, if you happen to watch this episode too, um, we'd love to, you know, see some excerpts from the books or whatever. Um, I know it would be it would be interesting to actually see him. So, but yeah, we appreciate the comment. 
Yes, we do very much. Message for you, son. And maybe you have a comment. Maybe you like that cool glow behind Dale. Maybe you like the way he flips the flips those the background. You're like, man, I'd like to have a Mac too. Uh, <laughs> why, <laughs> why can they tell me about it? <laughs> you can contact us at um, podcast at lcmspastor.com. And uh, you can Where'd you get that one from? What? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Podcast at, at, at sorry. crossfeednews.com. Yeah, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Don't ask me. My mind. I, I, <laughs> because we get getting this interesting feedback mail from uh, lcmspastor.com lately. That's, that's what's been going through my mind. I was like. Mm. Oh, yeah, we've been getting some horrible spam. And it, it goes, it runs through. lcmspastor.com is the other um, website that I run. And. Um, and it's, uh, we've been, the cross feed feedback mail runs through that, um, runs through that mail server and we've been getting really obnoxious feedback from it lately. Yeah. I, I'm going to put a, and try to put a caption on that to, per, to block the spammers. But the other way to get a hold of us is uh, to call our voicemail line 206-350-4749. And, uh, and or if you're watching this on iTunes, you. you can click right now and it'll take you right to it. Or you can go to our yeah, and I'll website. remember to put uh, that link thing in there too. Yeah, crossfeednews.com, so. and you can leave a comment there. So we're always looking for comments, yeah. always looking for your thoughts, uh, and we yeah, really we do appreciate hearing from you. Guys. you. Mm -hmm. We do so, hope. Oh, go ahead. And a uh, um, big thank you to our sponsor, PDAPerformance.com. Oh, look at that. Oh, very nice, Ben. It, and uh, if you have a, a Palm OS device, the new, the latest news is that the Palm OS is dead. So, um, I don't know. We'll see. Mine still works great. But uh, they make some really great software, and they also provide our hosting and bandwidth, and we appreciate that. And um, we won't be having a um, podcast. Are we going to have a podcast next week? I mean, I've got things to do Thursday. Um, yeah, Thursday's out for me. You know, let's. Uh, I'm not sure when we're going to be home Sunday, and so um, we're going to be kind of in and out. So I, I think we're going to take Thanksgiving off. Okay, so we hate to do that to you because I mean, it's only because we took a week off a, a bit ago, but we will get back on schedule and stuff. But uh, yeah, we do hope yeah. really you have a very blessed Thanksgiving that uh, you really are thankful for the good things that God's given you for the past year and that you just have a wonderful time, hopefully, with family and, and other people. And for those of you who can't get back to family, um, we pray that God is with you and uh, gives you comfort that time too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, everyone have a real blessed Thanksgiving. And uh, good night, everybody. And God bless. Good night. God bless.